you know, those, wasn't that cute, those kids bringing in and waving those palm branches, you know, and, and doing that. I, I thought about what that would have been like, you know, when Jesus would have come in that first Palm, palm Sunday and all, all the crowds singing Hosanna and the King is here, the King has come. And what would have been on their minds and their hearts as they would have thought about what was happening when Jesus made that entrance. And, you know, perhaps if it was like today, there would have been the guy with the sign held up. The end is here, you know, and, and you know, be, be, beware. It's the, the end is coming. And, and I, I would bet that no doubt there would have been people in the crowd that would have, that would have thought that. You know, Israel had been under Roman occupation for so, so long. And, and now they're hearing about this man who taught with authority. And, and this man who could perform signs and, and, and heal the sick and raise the dead and, and have control over the elements of the universe. And, and now he's coming. And they would have thought, this is it, this is the end. And Israel's going to receive back her glory. And, and get ready, Rome, because here, here we come. And, and uh, there were probably in, in some in the crowd that would have thought that, that this, this was the end. And it wasn't probably the end that they would have thought about there at all. And I wanted to take some time this week because I thought it was appropriate. Because I think in our day today, there's, there's kind of an increase in interest about people, especially within the church, about end times. People want to know. It seems like more today. They want to know how this, how's, how's the world going to end. And is what we're seeing in our culture right now with so many of the things that seem to be happening, are these signs that are leading up to, to the end? And does the Bible talk about these, these kinds of things? And, you know, like the people in the first century that were looking for a big change, you know, that, that kind of comes, it comes naturally for, for people that have to endure uh, some difficult times. And no doubt them, them then would have been struggling and suffering under another government's rule in their land. But I think today, you think about what we've gone through in the last couple of years, or even more than that, the last 10 or 20 years, what a lot of people have been experienced are, you know, they're, they're traumatic times. You know, we have these, these things and hear about war and, and terrorism and economic uncertainty, and we've had pandemics and plagues, and we've had racial unrest, and clearly a lot of immorality in our culture and governments and, and political systems that just seem to have so, so many problems. Life's much more difficult, it seems, today. <clears throat> I thought about you know, some of the TV shows back just in my lifetime <clears throat> that sort of tried to emulate a little bit of what life was like, like shows like Little House on the Prairie and The Waltons. And what was the other one I had in there? Oh, Andy Griffith. <clears throat> you know, those shows that definitely depicted... A simpler life, and in their setting, they tried to <clears throat> depict a little bit about what life was to be like. And <clears throat> no doubt, then things were simpler. There is an uneasiness about today. There's unrest, and there's there's what appears to be chaos and hatred and and, and a lack of control. So you know, you no wonder what's happening, especially with Ukraine and Russia. The people people are asking, you know, are we getting are we getting close to the end? Are these signs of the end, end of the age? And for us, for followers of Christ, we know that there, there is an end. We know that, that there is an end that is coming, and, and it really is not an end at all. It, it's not a final end. It's, it's really a transition into something that's new. And for us, we anticipate this newness to be, to be much better about when that would occur. When, when this would happen and this age comes to an end. And we should take comfort in that. We should take comfort in the fact that the end is going to come, and it's not something random. It's not something that's just going to happen, nor is it going to be something that's going to be determined by any, any humans. God has a plan for all of this. <clears throat> he has a plan for this time. He has a plan for our, our lives. And there's so much in Scripture about the end of times. And it's centered around the return, the return of Christ. David Jeremiah, some of you read him and follow him. Um, he's a local guy, actually. He got his what, what, big start. You probably know this. That he started uh, Black Hawk Christian um, years and years ago. Now he's a, kind of a world-renowned author. He's got a television program and Turning Point, I think, is his stuff. But he, he talks a little bit about how much of Scripture deals with the, re- with the return of Christ. 
and he says this. I'm going to quote what he says here. People are often surprised to learn that <clears throat> references to the second coming outnumber reference to the first coming by a factor of eight to one. Scholars have identified 1,845 different biblical reference, references to the second coming of Christ. Or put another way, one out of every 30 verses in the New Testament teach us that Jesus Christ is coming back to this earth. And that's something. You know, we know he came the first time and there was a lot of scriptures that talk about how he came 2,000 years ago and took on flesh and that whole Christmas story. You know, there's a lot of that. But he's saying there's so much more, eight to one, there is so much more in the Bible that deal with his, with his second coming. Listen to some of these. You know, he said there was 1,845 verses. I'm not going to read all those. We'd be here for a while. But let me read four of them. You know, when... Right after what we'll celebrate um, next week at Easter, you know, Christ, Christ returned and he, and, he, and he hung out for, for a while. And then he ascended to, to heaven and he, and he told his disciples that, he, that he, was, he was going. And the book of Acts records this. While he was going, they saw him leaving. They, the disciples, were gazing up toward heaven. Suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? I think that's kind of a silly question. You know, those guys said, did you just see that? You know, it seems like that was kind of a kind of a strange question to ask. But they followed it up. It really wasn't a question. It was it was this statement that brought tremendous comfort to those disciples who just saw Christ ascend to be with the Father. Those two men in white robes say this. This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. There's that first indication for these disciples who were trying to figure all this stuff out. They saw, they saw him die, and they saw him buried, and they saw him resurrected, and now they saw him leave their presence. But this awesome comfort that these two angels told the, the men, he's coming back in the same way you saw him go. Jill mentioned the passage this morning to the children. Uh, that Jesus is talking about. This is before this. He's talking to his disciples about the fact that I'm, I'm going to leave. And he says what Jill quoted here. I'm, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again and will take you to myself so that where I am, there you may be also. The promise of his return. One that's used quite often when we talk about Jesus' return it comes from the book of First Thessalonians. And, and Paul writes this, For the Lord himself, with a cry of command, with the archangel's call, and with the sound of God's trumpet, will descend from heaven, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Another promise, one of those 1,800 or so verses that talk about his return. And John records in Revelation another one of those verses, Look! He's coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And on his account, all the tribes of the earth will wail. So it is to be. Amen. And on and on and on. So many scriptural references that talk about Jesus' return. And that's our great hope. But the question, of course, we ask is when? When is that going to take place? Jesus ascended nearly 2,000 years ago and since then so many have wondered about well when when is this return going to happen and especially so in times that people go through terrible turmoil the church that has to go through those things they stop and pause and wonder could this could this possibly be it well, what did Jesus himself say about this you know we spent several weeks uh, and finished up last week in talk, talking about the Sermon on the Mount. We kind of had an overarching theme here that we're, you know, we want to know what God's Word is for us. And that's what this is. This is God's way of communicating to us His truth, and especially so, Jesus' very words. And that was our kind of our overarching theme as we looked at that sermon as a whole. How was He speaking to us? He spoke specifically to those people then but he speaks specifically to us when we engage it and when we, when we read it. So similarly, when we think about the end of times, what is it that, what is it that Christ says about that? Why not, why not look at what he had to say about that? Because, because they asked him about it. Jesus is in the area of Jerusalem. It was at the beginning of his end of time here on this earth. 2,000 some years ago, it was a Palm Sunday when he entered into Jerusalem. He came in, you know, the kids 
uh, commemorated with those with those palms and waving that that's how that's how he came he came in that week in the form of a parade and people shouting king of kings and hosanna and here he's come but the weeks we know ends with a cross on that on that friday and an empty tomb on that sunday and so much took place during that holy week the first holy week you know the gospel of john half of that whole book that john records half of it was just that week it was the holy week there half, all of the, all of the jesus 33 years of life half of the gospel of john is taken on during that week because so much happened he rode in on a donkey on that sunday and he rose from the dead the following sunday and in between there so much happened in fact, what happened there also was him talking not just about the end of his life, which was to take place in a week, but he talks about the end of the age, and he talks about his, his return. And it was during that week. We find it in three of the Gospels. It's in Mark 13 and Luke 21, and I'm focusing more on, on Matthew 24. So if you have your Bibles, you might want to open that, because I, I got a little lazy this week. I didn't put a whole lot of it in your bulletin or on, or on the screen, so you might want to follow along. In, in your Bibles. So this was during that, during that Holy Week. It was probably a Monday or Tuesday. It was, it was somewhere around there. And chapter 24 begins, it says, Jesus came out of the temple and was going away. His di- disciples came to point out to him the, building of, the buildings of the temple. Now remember what this is. This, this, this temple is really considered by many to be one of the seven wonders of the world, depending on whose seven wonders of the world you're you're counting. It was this magnificent structure that was in Jerusalem at the time. It had been rebuilt by Herod the Great. You know, it was originally Solomon built that temple hundreds of years ago. It gets destroyed. And then when the Jews come come back uh, several hundred years before this, they rebuild the temple. But Herod comes in and kind of Donald Trump's the thing and just jazzes the thing all up and makes it this awesome, awesome place. And the disciples say, check it out. You know, look at, look, at, look at this temple. Check this out. And Jesus says this. You see all these? Do you not, truly I tell you, not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. And boy, that got the disciples no, no doubt thinking. You know, they just saw this awesome structure was the center of their worship. This is where they connected with God. This is where they believed God resided. And now, you know, hey, look how cool this is. And Jesus says, ah, not one stone. Not one stone's going to be left here. They're, 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 they're going to be all, all turned over. So they wait till later in verse 3. So they left the temple area. And they go up to the Mount of Olives. And the disciples ask him privately. And in verse uh, 3, tell us, they ask him, when will this be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So they wanted to know. There it was. You know, you tell us this temple's going to get destroyed, and they want to know, how is this going to work? How, how, how are, is it that you're going to come, and when will this age end? And then Matthew then goes on in, his gospel, in, in the Gospel of Matthew. The next two chapters is Jesus' response to, to those questions. When is it that this is going to happen and when is it that your coming is going to be? And what will be the signs of the end of the age? That's three different questions. You know, I, I uh, put that up there before there. I added a couple spaces there. You could see that wasn't just one question. It was, it was three. And this language then that he's going to use throughout the rest of this couple of chapters, it's kind of cryptic. And so it makes for complete understanding of how all this is going to unfold. It makes it kind of hard. It's not that unlike other, other texts that the people would be familiar with and you and I are familiar with that are, that are equally kind of cryptic and symbolic. Books like Daniel and Ezekiel and Revelation, all, this, all of those books have references to how, how this age is going to come to an end. Are we there? Is the end near? We ask the same kind of, kind of questions. And so what happens then, we've got a lot of different understandings of how this is going to take place. You know, people that are theologians that have thought a lot about this have come up with different understandings of how this is going to take place. And there's some words here that, are, that might be some new words to you regarding what's happening here. Is, you know, one's, a, one's a second coming. That is when Jesus physically returns to this earth. 
And inside of there they talk about a millennial reign, which means a a thousand year reign of when Jesus is here physically ruling and reigning humanity. Final judgment is the time when, when, when Jesus is there to judge all of human humankind. Tribulation talks about a time of where there's great stress, uh, terrible turmoil within the earth that is here. And another term that's used is rapture that, is, that talks about when uh, the, the church or those that are in Christ are, are taken off and, and exit this, this earth. And, and there's, there's different... Um, there's different interpretations of them, and, and they're up on the screen here. I'll come over here so I can see them a little better. But all of them have these things in common. The church started there at the cross. Way back there, 2,000 years ago, uh, the church began with Christ's completed work at the cross and at Pentecost when the, when the Holy Spirit came and this, and this church formed. And all of them have, uh, at the other end of this, an, an ending. And the ending is this eternal bliss where we are in the presence of God for all eternity. But there are several interpretations, some of them that are common. The top one is called a, pre, uh, a, a premillennial return of Christ. So in that viewpoint, all of history since the beginning of church has been going through tribulation. It's tough. It's, in this viewpoint, in this premillennial look, the top, top one there, it's just difficult until... Christ returns. His second coming will bring this difficult time to an end. And then there will be a thousand year reign of, of Christ's rule and reign here on earth. That's called a pre-millennial uh, end, end time viewpoint. The second one is called uh, a pre-tribulation, pre-millennial dispensational. <laughs> There's a lot of big words. Uh, theology of this. And in, in that one... It is where Christ comes and he takes the church, which they, the people that believe this call that the, the rapture. And so those that are in Christ are taken from this world. And then shortly after that is what the Bible talks about, this time of tribulation. And they view it as being a seven literal year, horrible kind of time that's, that's here on earth. But the church is, is taken away. After that, Christ then returns with his church to bring in an end to all of the tribulation and the power of Satan and evil is gone. And again, there is this 1,000 year reign of Christ here, here on earth. The third one there is called a post-millennial return. And that's where the belief there is that the, the, the world's going to slowly come to Christ through the church and the work of the kingdom workers that are here and now. And we're going to get to this point where we are all under his rule and reign and his lordship now during this, this long period of, of thousand years. And at the end of that, his, his return will take place. The bottom one's called... Uh, a millennial, or is there really no literal 1,000 years, we're all really under his rule and reign now. When he came, and when the Spirit came, and enabled all of his believers uh, to have and experience the power. But we, we're living under his rule and reign here and now. And so that one is represented in the bottom one, and at the end of that, Christ is going to come back and usher in some kind of new age. So yeah, there are four different kind of views. There's other ones that are out there. Those are probably the most popular views that seem to be kind of traveling around uh, our churches, our churches today. And you know, bottom line is we really, we really don't know. You know, I kind of, I kind of go back and I, I wish those disciples would have done a little better job asking that question. You know, why, why, why couldn't have they, you know, been a little more specific there? I said, Lord, you know, can you tell us a year? How many years from now are you going to come? And, you know, can you tell us some specific things that are going to happen there? And, and who's going to win the Masters in 2022 so we could place our bets accordingly? I'm sure we got, he would have given us a bad look on that one. But they didn't. They asked this question, you know, when will this happen? You know, you talk about the temple being destroyed. What's it going to happen? And, and when are you coming? And what will be the signs of, of your return? And he, and he starts talking about that. What adds to the difficulty of, of, of the language that we'll get into here in a little bit, because it's kind of cryptic, is that it's some of what he's talking about that is going to take place actually gets fulfilled pr- pretty quickly after he says these words. They're fulfilled in the year 70 A.D. That's when Jerusalem gets destroyed. And the temple, that's what he's talking about there gets destroyed by Rome. And historians will say it is exactly like he said. There was not one stone that was left there. 
Some say the reason for that is there was gold in between every one of those stones, and they knocked those stones over to get the gold out so they could take that as, as pillage. So part of what he says in fulfillment to this question that a lot of people are gleaning on already has taken place. But that was their first question, right? Because, you know, the disciples pointed out, hey, look at this cool building. Isn't it awesome? <clears throat> and Jesus says, yeah, it's all going to get knocked down too. And the first part of their question, when will that happen? And so some of what he's saying is, is what will happen will take place, <clears throat> excuse me, in just 40 some years. But then couple that with some of the other predictions that will happen much, much, much later. And they haven't, they haven't happened yet. And for some people, they think what some of the words that Jesus says in his text will actually be fulfilled two or maybe even three times. That they'll happen and then they'll happen again. And that just makes it even more difficult when we think about, you know, the hows and whens this is all going to occur. So let's look at those words. And I'm going to go through this pretty, pretty briefly, but I would, I would encourage you to maybe go home today and read through those couple of chapters there and see what, see what you think. Allow the Lord to speak to you through those words. So he begins his answer. When's this stuff going to take place? When's the temple going to get knocked down? When, you, when, when is your coming going to be in? And what will be the signs that that's happening? First word, Jesus, in his response in verse 4 says, Beware. Beware that no one leads you astray, for many will come in my name saying, I am the Messiah, and they'll lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed. You know, one of your ears kind of think a little bit about, you know, these they would have these people that would have heard this, and they're looking for these signs, you know, and and they would obviously be asking, Well, am I seeing this now? You know, and I think that's good for us to think a little bit about too. Because he's telling you, you know, here's what's gonna happen. He's going to, you're going to hear wars and rumors of wars. And I think for us, let's ask that question. Are we seeing that? Are we hearing about that? See that you're not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All this is but the beginning of birth pangs. They will hand you over to be tortured and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of my name. Then many will fall away and they will betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because of the increase of lawlessness, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this good news of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the world as a testament to all nations. And then the end will come. So he begins and talks about several of these things that... You know, he, 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 he doesn't say, don't worry about it. Oh, don't worry about it. I'll come when I'm ready to come. No, he said, look for these things. Look for these things. And so the ears of his first hearer would have been attuned to looking for, for wars and earthquakes and famines and, and uh, false, false teachers and lawlessness and, and, and the loss of love. It, it, your ears are attuned to this because Jesus says, beware of these things. And then he gets a little more detail in verse 15. He says, you know, so when you see the desolating sacrilege standing in, standing in the holy place, as was spoken by the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. And those in Judea must flee to the mountains. The one on the housetop must go down and to take what, it must not go down to take what was in the house. And he goes on there. And this is one of those that probably has some multiple fulfillments. You'd have to go back to Daniel and read about this. But Daniel speaks about this abomination that causes desolation is what he refers to it in his book and it talks about someone going into the holy of holies into the into their temple into their church into the most sacred spot of their church and doing something that was sacrilegious this happened after daniel's prophecy but way before the time of christ when antiochus epiphanes came in it did something terrible in in their temple which made their temple area unclean for a very long time and jesus refers to that he says, so, so watch what happens there. Well, that, you know, that already happened, but Jesus seems to be an implying. It happened then, but it's going to happen again. And it does. It happens in 70 when Rome comes in. They came into that temple area and did stuff to it there that desolated it and made it unclean. And, and then there are those that say, yeah, it happened then, but it's going to happen once again. In the, in the future. So that's one of those kind of a difficult thing to, to read through that has perhaps multiple fulfillments. But when that happens, he goes on to say in 29, immediately after the suffering of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of heaven will be shaken. 
Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and all of the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. Just like, just like those disciples, or the angels told the disciples. You'll see him coming back as he left. But he'll come with power and of great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather the elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. So he describes how this is going to happen. Coming with great power, and he's calling his elect, calling, calling his church. And now there's a shift in his teaching about this. He, he shifts from so much of the specifics, maybe about the events that are going to happen before then, or, or um, you know, perhaps a time in in history what will take place, because he gets very specific. He says in 36, but about that day and hour, no one knows. Neither the angels of heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. He, the Son doesn't even know when this has happened. He doesn't know. Only the Father. He says, for as the days of Noah, you know that story were, how that story worked, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For in, as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark. So he tells a little bit about what it's going to be like. You know, people are just going to be about their normal, normal life, just like it was uh, f- f- for Noah. But important to that passage there is, you know, nobody knows. I don't even know, Jesus is telling them. Only, only the Father. And he finishes that with a statement that says, Therefore, you also must be ready, as those in Noah's family were prepared for what was happening. He's saying to us, and he's saying to the disciples, And be ready, for the Son is coming in an unexpected hour. He's talking about being prepared. He gets us to think a little bit less about the specifics and he starts focusing a little bit more on how he ought to be. And that actually is how he finishes out the rest, the rest of, of this uh, discourse. It's called the Olivet Discourse because they're on the Mount of Olives here. And he finishes up with three parables because that's what Jesus does a lot. He speaks so, so much in, in parables. And in there he's teaching them about the end times but not so much about the specifics there but how you ought to be in response that there is a time of end coming the first one's about about faithful or unfaithful slaves he said blessed is, is the slave who comes and his master finds him at work when he returns and he contrasts that to the slave that says ah don't worry about it master's gone I'm not going to worry about that which he has entrusted me to do And he's making this comparison about those who were prepared for the end and those who were not prepared for the end. The second one, and I'm sweeping over these very fast, is the parable of the ten bridesmaids. The bridegroom is coming and these bridesmaids were ready for the party. We don't get all this because we don't understand the social structure so much of what weddings were like then. But it was really important on the day of of the wedding. Who got to go to the wedding party and who was allowed in because at at some point the doors were shut and you were left out. And Jesus said there were five bridesmaids that were smart and wise and there were five that weren't. Why? The five that were smart had taken extra oil. They were prepared in case the bridegroom, the bride, the groom would be would be delayed. They took extra oil in case at night he would come, and they would have they would have been ready where the other five were not. And just as they had prepared for, the groom was late, and when he announced his arrival, five of them were ready. Five had to go back to town and get oil because they weren't prepared, and they were shut out. Again, there is this contrasting comparison between those that were ready for the event and those that were not ready for the event. His teaching for us and for them was keep awake in verse 12. For you neither know the day nor the hour. Stay awake and be prepared. That's the teaching for us. And the last one is the parable of the talents. A talent for them at the time was, was, was money. Uh, we've taken that to mean a, a talent for us today as, as resources that we have. But then it was, it was money. And he talks about this. For it is as if a man going on a journey, verse 14, summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another each, and to another one. Five to one, two to another, one to the last, each according to his ability. And then he takes off and he leaves. And when he returns, he he comes back to see what those people had done with that which he had left them with. 
And the first one says, you know, I had these five and I turned them back into five more based on what I did with them. And the master says to him, likewise, the guy that had two did the same thing. He, he, he doubled what he was given. And to both of those slaves, the master says to them, well done, good and trustworthy slave. You've been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. But the last one was kind of chicken. He said, I was afraid because you're kind of a tough dude. And so I hid your money away. Here's back the one talent that you gave to me. And the master says to them, you ought to have invested my money with the bankers on my return. I would have least received what was own, what, what my own what was my own with with interest so he says so take the talent from him and give it to the one with ten for all those who have will be given more and they will have abundance but for those who have nothing even what they have will be taken away here's the strong words between the contrasting between those that are ready and those that are not verse 30 says and for this worthless slave throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth So in the middle of this answering the question about, you know, when are these things going to take place? Jesus is spending a lot of time talking about how you ought to be to be prepared for the end. And then specifically, he says, when the Son of Man comes in glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates sheep from the goats. It's that black and white to him. He will come and bring all the people before him and it is as evident to him as sheep and goats. And he could put them on the side, again, contrasting those who were ready and those who were prepared and those who weren't. And then he talks about those that were righteous, those sheep. And he says this about them. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothes. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Those are the sheep. Those are on his right. Those are the ones that are righteous. And it's those then that come back and ask this awesome question. Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and gave you food? Thirsty and gave you drink? When was it we saw you a stranger and welcomed you or saw you naked and gave you clothes? And was was it that we saw you sick and imprisoned and, and, and visited you? The righteous ones didn't, really? When did we see you this way, they ask him. And the king will return the answer. I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it unto me. Those righteous, the ones that were prepared, the ones that were ready for the end, they fed the hungry, they gave drink to the thirsty, they welcomed the stranger, they clothed, the naked, they visited those that were sick and, in, and imprisoned. They did that. But they didn't know when they did that, they were actually doing it to him. And then contrasting that, those that, those that were the goats, those that were not prepared for this end that was coming, he says the similar statement. You know, I was hungry and you gave me nothing. I was thirsty, you gave me nothing. I was a stranger, you did nothing for me. I was naked, you did nothing for me. And they ask a similar question. When was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick? When was it? And he said, I tell you, just as you did not do unto the least of these, you also did not do unto me. And he says, go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. There it is. This teaching he's talking about the end. He's making this contrasting, pretty evidently clear message about what it is that we ought to be doing as we prepare for the end. That's more important than knowing about the end. It's being ready for the end. Neither the righteous, and that last one if I picked up this time, neither the righteous or the accursed ever saw Jesus. It appears, though, that both of them saw the people that were in need. They saw the hungry, and they saw the naked, and they saw the thirsty, and they saw the imprisoned, and they saw the sick. The difference is those that were prepared, their actions were all the difference because they responded to the righteousness that they, that they had. That was, that was the difference. The message here in all of that text that he has that I went through so briefly is this. When's this going to happen? 
how are we going to know what are the signs of the end of the age? The bulk of his message is less about this and it's more about this. Stay awake. Be prepared. Be ready. Use your talents, your money, your gifts, your resources, the skills you have, your very life as you wait and you watch for my return. And stay working. Work for the Father. That's the work that we are to be doing. Loving and caring for all of those that are, that are in great need. You know, to me, the takeaway of this Olivet Discourse that talks about the end of the age and when this is all going to happen, the biggest takeaway, I believe, first and foremost, God's got it. He's in, he's in control. Even in the middle of all the chaos that we have in our world, and it just seems like we're accelerating in a, in a bad way in a lot of areas in our, in our world with all, the, with all the wars and the pandemic and the unrest and the hate and all this stuff that just seems to be ramping up. Are we, are we approaching the end? God's got it. Are we getting closer to the end? Well, yeah, my answer is yep. Yep, we are. Every day we get up, we're one day closer. That's kind of the, the cheap way. But no, no doubt, no doubt we're getting there. And we're told that it, it's going to get worse. This chaos that we have, that it seems it's, it's pretty bad, it could and it will get much, much, much worse, especially for those who are far from God. In regards to thinking about the end of the age, consider what this means for those who've rejected the saving grace of Christ. It gets horribly worse for them. And perhaps that's why there's this long delay of time. Maybe this is one of the reasons. It's for, it's for us kingdom workers to fo- just to get done what needs to get done. To draw in as many people that could be drawn into God's fold. To be found on the right side of the sheep and the goats when that end happens. Because it will get so, so much worse. We can make, we can make light of an eternal damnation in hell, and we do. You hear jokes about, well, I'm going to hell, but, you know, it's, I'm going to have a lot of my friends there and we'll be partying, partying together. The truth is so far from any, any kind of joke that can be there because we can't fathom how horrible that will be. You can't make light of it because it's a truth that's that's coming. And so, therefore, then for us, who are kingdom workers, this this just ought to be awesome motivation for us to do what we're called to do, to be be ones that are making disciples, to be the salt and the light that we're called to be, to be working, working for those to be attached to that which is so good because we know what's good is just great and we have such, such hope in that. And then again, I think the, the other takeaway from this, it, it, again, it's less about the whens and the hows and the specifics, but it's so much more about how it is we ought to be living as his disciples, knowing that the end is coming. It should affect our, our behavior. We should behave differently, knowing that this end is coming. Our behavior should reflect this goodness that he's given us. Our behavior should reflect an awesome stewardship of the righteousness that he's given to us. We've been speaking about that the last, last several weeks an awful lot. We've, we've been given this righteousness which gets us on the right side of him when the, end, when the end comes. We should be responding in an awesome way to this, this mercy and forgiveness that he's given to us, to, to we that believe that happened on an Easter so, so long ago. Our behavior ought to be one that is watching for this purpose that, we, that we're seeing. And, and, and we may be experiencing an end of an age soon. We should be responding to that and being ready and being constantly prepared to do His work, His kingdom work here and now for the people that so desperately need to be found in Him. Would you join me in prayer? My standing, please. Father, the end is near. It's it, for sure it's near. Whether it is our physical death or whether it is your 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 return, we pray that as we review and reflect uh, the words that your Son spoke to us about that time, and the trueness and the sureness of that time that is coming, by your Spirit, would you enable us to take those to heart, to be a people that live in this awesome hope that you are returning. 
And again, by your Spirit, allow us to be mindful of what happened then, 2,000 years ago, and what you've done for us. This week, as we look at this Holy Week and think about the awesomeness of your love for us, allow it to then penetrate out of our lives and into our dark world. In Christ's name, amen. Have a great week.